If you can kind of get that little wiggle in the pocket and like stall the board that way, just letting the board do the work and not trying to enforce your will on it. Just when in doubt, go with the size. I actually like pintails a lot for beginners and I just think an 8 is honestly like where 95% of new surfers should start. You're gonna make it down the line, but then all those turns and stuff now just became a lot tighter. He's not trying to look cool. He's just goofing off, having fun, and he's incredibly good at it. Welcome to the Basis Surf Podcast. We're with Dave Ali from Almond Surfboards. Super stoked because they shape amazing boards. Uh, based in SoCal, I know that Andy Neoblis rides for him. Um, long boards, mid lengths, fishes, all sorts of craft. And uh, I think the coolest thing about you guys is uh, I just love that tagline that you have that with the right attitude and the right equipment, even two foot waves can be firing. And I love that because. I don't know. I think a lot of surfers, that's all they get to surf. That's literally, well, they get it. That's what they get to surf like 90% of the time. And then the other, you know, 10%, then they get lucky every once in a while. At least that is the way here in the East coast. I mean, you guys yeah. are so SoCal though. So you guys get like, you guys get a lot more consistent waves than that, but lots we of smaller, do. softer days too, huh? Totally. And Newport isn't San Clemente or, you know, like there's, places that pick or even Huntington like picks up more swell than we do. So, uh, yeah, we felt like the two feet in firing or the, you know, the right attitude and the right equipment, even two foot days can be firing is just a fair representation of kind of what our day-to-day -day surf experience is and trying to make the most of those everyday conditions. Cause that's the reality of what we see when we drive down to the beach. And that has been kind of the ethos of our brand in some various forms for the last 15 plus years. Yeah. And I mean, I can say having the right equipment makes all the difference <laughs> and the right mindset. I, I, those, you hit it right on the head, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, but having the right equipment probably is the first piece because you can have the right attitude and the wrong equipment and you're not going to have fun. Right. <laughs> totally. And again, it's just like, I laugh, like even talking about it. Cause it's like, that's literally our surf experience is like, man, I just have a lot more fun when I bring a bigger board out and I catch a lot more waves and the waves are usually pretty crappy. And, but when you're like out there hooting and hollering, even in like blown out surf with your buddies <clears throat> and everyone's on a log, like it can be really fun as long as your expectations are set correctly and you got enough foam, it, it really can be fun and pretty junky surf. Man. Well, I got a log. I'm borrowing a buddy's log, which I'm pretty psyched on. I've taken it out a decent, <laughs> like a couple of times. And you know what? I'd have to say it totally opens that world up. I still suck at riding a log. I mean, I probably look like the biggest asshole, but like I'm having fun doing it, you know? Um, and I, I think I do need to like get out there more on it for sure. It's hard here. I mean, it just snowed here in New York. So it's like... Am I going to really, you know, go out there and try to ride a log in one foot waves? Uh, yeah, it, it's a little bit harder because, you know, the conditions qu aren't quite as nice. But totally. um, yeah, that, I think I think that is the key. So why don't we actually kind of dive in kind of from the beginning? I mean, um, you know, how did you how did you found Almond? Like what's uh, what was the basis and the origin story there? Can I give you one logging tip before we do that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Give it to us. So I jump around on equipment a lot, but I've primarily been a long border for most of my life. And I'd say the, the men, I've talked to a lot of dudes who've like surfed short boards for their whole life and then are trying to like jump on a log either because they want to like get out with their kids or they just are finally wanting to diversify their equipment. And I think <clears throat> obviously like you have to be incredibly patient when you jump on a long board because it's not like I'm going to get up and go and I'm going to like generate speed and force this thing down the line so i think rocking back on your back foot and then kind of feeling the board just do this a little bit like if you mm -hmm. can kind of get that little wiggle in the pocket and like stall the board that way and then slide up and kind of feel the board accelerate and then like stall and do just a very subtle like this you'll start to kind of feel that like all right look i can like put the brakes on and then i can like let it trim again and put the brakes on, let it trim again. And I think that kind of helps the mind get into the like speed and rhythm or lack of speed of like just letting the board do the work and not trying to enforce your will on it. 
Yeah. So I'm, that's my hot login tip. Hot login tip. I love it. That's probably going to be key because I imagine if I'm trying to force like a 10 foot board, it's not, I'm not going to be able to force anything, right? I'm just going to like fall over and just look like a complete kook. I mean, yeah, you can't, you can't do turns the same way, right? So I like I, that. That is a beautiful tip though. Like just a way to like feel it out and just get used to it. I really like that. Okay. You're going to have to, uh, give me a lot more of these tips so I don't look as much of a kook, but, uh, why don't we, uh, why don't we kind of start at the beginning with you then? So yeah. What was the story Sounds behind all good. that? Uh, I was an enthusiastic 20 something. I guess I was started shaping surfboards kind of in my parents' garage as like a 19 year old. Yeah. 19 year old, um, after high school. So that would have been like 2004, 2005. I think I finished my first board in like 2006. Um, just and can like I ask you a question? Stoked Grom. Yeah, 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 like what what got you into shaping? You know, because like there's so many people that surf, but like I think it takes a peculiar kind of person to be like, all right, I'm gonna try to make my own board. You know, especially logs because they're freaking huge. You know, like they look like yep. a lot of work. So how did it start? Yeah. Uh, my dad is an engineer and very like tactile, so he was always doing projects in the garage, and so I think during my formative years, most of my like hanging out with my dad was just like being out in his shop as he's working on some project um, and like working on projects together. And so I think it was just standing out there in the garage talking one day and I was like, we should try to build a surfboard. And, and you know, I was just all stoked on surfing at that point in my life. Uh, and so just spent, I think a year reading, doing research, asking people, bothering shapers who were older than me and like probably shouldn't have given me their time. And there wasn't nearly as many resources back then. I think like, I think Swaylox was like an existence of like, as like a shapers forum. And there's like a couple articles you could find online. Um, there was like the classic John Carper DVD. The, have, you ever, have you ever seen this? Like the I've never JC seen Hawaii, like surfboard shaping 101. He had like a DVD in the nineties. It's like the most nineties video ever. Um, but yeah, it's like the resources that weren't that like extensive. So I spent like a long time planning this out made the six, five single fin, then wanted to do a five, 10 fish. And it wasn't until like my fifth or sixth board that I attempted a log. Um, but yeah, it was just like, they were rough and crude and, uh, trying to be patient, trying to like walk away, come back at the project with fresh eyes, but just loved surfing and loved board building. And I, I've always been really big on like the brand side of things and like creating a brand that to invite people into and, you know, the first thing I did after college was sign a lease on a little surf shop and like want people to be able to step into the almond experience. Mm. So yeah, that's been kind of my journey. I did. I honestly, so opened the shop in March of 2009. So coming up on 15 years ago and I honestly expected I'd probably do it for a year or two and then I'd have to grow up and get a real job. And I've just been stubbornly paddling in the same direction for all these years and yeah, still at it. <laughs> Well, nice. It looks like it's paying off. I mean, wait, so I have some, I have some questions here. So the first boards you shape like yeah. a six, five single fin and then a five ten fish, a five ten fish. So you were always kind of into more alternative boards, you know, and you yeah. know, you said a long board was like a, you know, like your fifth or sixth board. So you've always been kind of into the more alternative boards. Like what, what drew you to shaping those kinds of boards? Grew up predominantly longboarding, loved longboarding. And then like early 2000s, like I think the reason I did that 6.5 single fin is I think Thicker Than Water was like, you know, a new release at that point. And there's like that segment of Rob Machado and all those guys riding that green single fin. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like look how sick this thing is. It like washes up on the beach. I'm trying to like, you know, pause the DVD and get like a glimpse at it. Uh, but yeah, there was just like a lot of cool stuff. I think it was like the very early parts of the kind of ride everything movement were like happening then and those were like my formative years and i'm just sponging up as much surf inspiration as possible right and that totally fits into that ethos of the right you know attitude and the right equipment making everything firing because you know back then i'm sh you know th that was the beginning but there's still very much like this emphasis on you write a you know shortboard and that's about it right so totally. that totally fits in there and i'm sure it just like unlocked your fun right uh, was that a fair way to describe it? you're just like i'm just having way more fun when it's like small and crappy on these boards 
Yeah, and I think I rode the longboard for so long, or had a couple of them, but uh, I had a cousin who was older than me, and I remember I wrote an article about this recently called The Best Surf Advice Anyone's Ever Given Me, but he basically was like, if you ever see a fish with a swallowtail that's at least a shaka wide uh, and you see a good deal on it, like pick it up, because he had like just been to Costa Rica and like surfed a fish down there. And was like, it'll blow your mind. And I was like, okay. So I just kind of blindly took his advice and uh, picked up a twin fin fish that I'd found. It was like a blemish in the rack somewhere. And that was my first like foray into like something that wasn't a longboard. And I was like, it, that that was very eye opening and very formative for me. Mm. I surfed that board into the ground in my early twenties. And what what did it teach you? I guess. I mean, going from a longboard to a short, I mean, to a fish, it's going to be. It's going to be a, a transition, but like that, yeah. What was that transition like for you? Uh, I could not believe the timing difference at first. Like when you're like accustomed to just sitting outside, gliding into waves, all of a sudden, like all of your space and timing awareness stuff was. I remember, I still remember that very first session being like, oh my gosh, have I made a terrible mistake? <laughs> um, but then as you like get more comfortable on it and get more comfortable paddling it, just the ability to. Uh, explore more parts of the wave face and take off on stuff that you otherwise probably wouldn't take off on. Like it just, this that board specifically, it just it was so flowy and yeah, I loved it. I was like, man, this thing is awesome. And I just destroyed it over the next four or five years. That's sick. And I think what's interesting is, you know, what I'm hearing anyway is that, you know, at that the point where you jumped onto the fish, you'd been riding the log for a while now at that point, right? You know, I feel like so many people just like ride a soft top and then just jump onto a shortboard as quick as possible. But right. having that formative like training, riding a log, and then t and taking your time and going onto the fish, that must have been really beneficial. I mean, how did you see it? It certainly informed my surfing in a particular way where, you know, I joke about this a lot, but like I'm always big on catching waves early, getting into waves early, getting to your feet early because everything else can kind of fall into place when you do that. But like, I hate late takeoffs, like taking off under the lip, trying to get your knees to your chest. And like, I, I can't, I'm like terrible at it. So I'm like, in some senses, I'm like projecting my own personal surf preferences onto our customers and like the ethos of the brand. But it's like, I still see people in the water who are late getting up, late getting to their feet, they hit the bottom and then they've lost all speed and the wave's gone and they're like, oh, well, you know, I guess I'll paddle back out and try again. I'm like, oh my gosh, if you just got into that wave like two strokes earlier and like set your rail, like it's just the like crawl before you walk, before you run stuff that I still see so many surfers struggling with. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that's what riding, that's one of the reasons why I was like, all right, I'm going to ride this log more because I think it's forcing me to, I mean, you can kind of cork into a wave late on a log as well, but like your best rides are when you get in before the wave is even broken, right? And I'm like, oh. I want to be good at that because I want to do the same thing when I ride my shortboard, you know, like the earlier you get in, the better it's going to be. The best surfers are usually getting it, unless you're like, trying to surf like you know a slab or really get barreled but like most of the time they're trying to yeah. get in early you know so yeah. it's um ah, i totally agree and when you see a really like a really really high level surfer in the water they scratch into waves as they're scratching into waves like out you know in here in newport like past the jetty where the longboarders are sitting and it's like they're getting into the waves like same time as the longboarders and they're just it's like the technique and the like proficiency is so high that you're like I, I don't know how they do that, but there's just, when you right. see someone really good in the water, you notice. Oh, for sure. That the, the better they are, usually the earlier they get into the wave is what I've noticed for almost sure. always. Either that or they're getting in super duper late and <laughs> just like, you know, yes. it, it's one, but it's extremes. Those two extremes are usually, and it's usually how it goes. Um, yeah. So, you know, so you get into shaping and you're, you're building this business and obviously it's, it's centered around Newport beach. And so could you tell me about like how that informed, you know, the way you developed your brand and the boards and, and all that? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it was informed by the kinds of waves here. Like obviously we have blackies, which is a very like popular longboard spot. It's just a very classic beach break. That's like pretty wide open. There's peaks kind of all over the place. 
and there'll be little packs and pockets of like uh, crowds that kind of hover around different peaks. But it's like that 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 wave specifically, I would say, was very informative or formative in my like surfing and therefore board preferences and therefore like some of our early boards that we built. Um, and then as you start like wandering out and venturing out more places, surfing different types of waves, like the board models start kind of shifting and evolving to start suiting a wider range of waves. But I'd say like Blackie's had a tremendous impact, just that, that wave itself on like at least the very early formative boards we were doing. Hey everyone, it's Van. Hopefully you've been enjoying the podcast. Hopefully you've been listening to some good stories, getting some good tips that are helping you improve as a surfer. If so, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, it'll only take you literally a few seconds, and share it with your friends. That's the best way you can support me so I can continue to create awesome new content for you. So thanks. Yeah, interesting. That's not Griffin's background. That's not his background. Okay. No, and not then, at all. Griffin... And- Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what's his, what's his background? Uh, grew up in Long Beach, uh, primarily short border, and apprenticed for Bruce Jones for a number of years. When when I met him, he was apprenticing for Bruce and kind of ghost shaping for Bruce. Um, so I was coming from this like very full round rail, full outlines, and we're kind of like morphing in the middle and trying to figure out like how do you borrow notes from yesteryear and like modify it for modern function and it was kind of a cool like tug of war yin yang that we had particularly early on as we were kind of finding and settling into our lane and and just so everybody on the podcast knows griffin is your your head shaper right yeah sorry i forgot that was off air uh yeah uh griffin is our head shaper been working with him for almost 16 years since before we even opened the shop super good guy and hard worker and very passionate about what he does that's interesting but he he comes from more of a shortboarding background but he also rides a log and knows how to do all you know now he does now he does hey but maybe that's actually like maybe that's actually like an asset in a way because he had to like figure it all out and figure how to make the board work for him you know and i'm sure at this point yeah we're coming from these like very opposing backgrounds and just like converging in the middle somewhere right or or you guys clash and it just turns into a trippy board that doesn't work, right? But so, but there must be like beautiful experiments that got they went right because of that as well, right? Totally. There's a couple of uh, Frankenstein's in our archives, but uh, for the most part, I'd say it's been yeah. I, for the most part, I'd say it's been a, mostly a good, beautiful compromise. Interesting. So, what board of yours? Obviously, you have your logs or, you know, you could be talking about a log or, or any of your boards. Like, what board exemplifies, like, what Almond is about or what feeling are you trying to give surfers? You know, I was talking to Ryan Lovelace and he was, like, talking about how he wants to, he wants to, so if some random person were to jump on his board and not know it was him, they'd be like, oh, this is one of, this is one of my boards. This is a Ryan Lovelace board because of this special feeling. Is there any kind of, like, feeling that you're trying to give your riders or just a, a specific approach. I mean, your motto, your tagline kind of says a lot of it, but yeah, I would say kind of like we touched on first and foremost, I really want to build boards that paddle extremely well, get into waves early. And then from that moment, it's kind of up to like the preferences of the surfer. So like whether nose riding is the goal, we want to build really good, really solid nose riders that are as good as anyone else is out there. Or if it's just like cruising and exploring all parts of the wave, like we have a mid-length model for that. And it's so like the, yeah, I would say like the, the goal is always like very effortless glide, kind of low continuous rockers, boards that feel like they're just going to fly and then solving solving problem B as like a separate issue next, which is like, okay, then where do you want to take your surfing? Yeah. I'm curious, what did Ryan say that feeling was? Did he have like a... For him, for yeah, for him it was because yeah, you, I know you guys know each other, but for him it was, um, it's like he said he wants to be able to go balls down the line, and yep, but also have this ball bearing loose kind of like like cool. floaty ball bearing feeling, which I think is kind of what he gets on his boards. I, I rode one of his V bowls like a while ago, and and that definitely had that feeling. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
and I told you off air, but like he and I used to chat a ton kind of in the very early formative days when we were both, we both kind of got started around the same time, like 2007, 2008 ish um, in shaping and board building. And we would laugh about how different it was building a surfboard brand in Newport beach versus Santa Barbara, both like the cultures and the waves and everything. So different, like he's thinking ring con and down the line speed and like just boards that just fly down the line. And we're thinking, okay, we got to build a board that's like, the waves aren't going to be that good. So the board needs to be like pretty generous. And it, you know, it's just, it, the whole mindset's just so different. Um, and obviously that's 15 years ago now, but um, well, it, that's it, it is interesting to still hear notes of that. Yeah. But that's actually a really fascinating thing to talk about. Right. Because, you know, here if you're surfing in Brooklyn, it's, you know, at Rockaway beach or not Brooklyn, but Queens, if you're serving at Rockaway beach or long beach or New Jersey, you know, we got jetties just like Newport does, you know, you're not getting yeah. the longest rides ever. Like how does a board for Newport or for the East coast differ from like a perfect point, you know, C street or Rincon or whatever probably shorter rail lines and more like snubby outlines where you can kind of like surf in the pocket more and have a little more maneuverability versus this like long down the line point and shoot like bottom turn load that fin up and then just project into the you know stratosphere um yeah i i wish we had a left point right out front <laughs> but so far no one wants to build it <laughs> <laughs> right nice and then what about the, um, cause you, you talked about like the culture and the community, like how, you know, it's interesting cause Ryan told me some stories about like what the, the folks up in, you know, some of the, <laughs> you know, Ventura and Santa Barbara locals were like, you know, when he was shaping, like, well, what, how would the communities influence like your brand and all of that and in, in your business? Yeah. I mean, if I remember correctly speaking to him back then, it was kind of like, there was this ingrained group of guys who'd been building boards there for a long time. And Ryan was kind of an outsider to that and building these new boards. And it was kind of like, Whoa, what's this guy doing? Like, whereas here, I don't know that there was so much of like the established old guard as because Newport's so like, there's just so many pockets, like so much of the surf industry, especially at that time was here. And so I was never really trying to have Almond like penetrate into the surf industry and like ruffle feathers or like get noticed. It was like, we're going to, we're going to create our own little like swimming pool over here and we're just going to kind of do our thing. And if people want to come in and like hop in, like, that's great. The door's open. We have a retail store, like, come on, you're all are welcome to come check it out. But, uh, not being so centered around like a single spot. Like I wouldn't even, even though like Blackie's is as a surf break was so formative to my surfing early surfing years and like shaping years, I never really considered myself like a blackies guy. I wasn't like a wall bird hanging out there, like trying to ingrain myself in that community. I don't know. It's just like we had our own little pocket. We're going to create our own little thing and like do the stuff that we're excited about. So I think it's different that way where it's like so all over the place here. There's so much, so many little pockets of culture, so many brands and it's not as like maybe small tight knit as other surf towns. Yeah, I could see that. <clears throat> yeah, I could see that. I mean, just that whole area you're in, that's like, you know, the center of the surf industry in so many ways. So there's just a million things going on and you can kind of fly under the radar and do your own thing and, you know, build your own community, totally. which is probably pretty cool. And and it, it also speaks to probably the way your breaks are, you know, you got lots of different spots you can probably surf whereas you're just gonna surf one point you know you're gonna run into the same people all the time and it's gonna be oh, a different right. experience yeah huh interesting um so just talk uh, talking a little bit more about longboards right so like what uh what tips would you give to somebody that's like thinking about picking a longboard like how do you even like I mean, I just borrowed my friend's Christensen because it looks cool. And he was like, I'm not using it. But like, if I'm trying to decide, okay, I'm what kind of longboard to get, like what, what is that decision-making process? Like how should someone think about it? I think it really comes down to what your goals are with longboarding. Like, let's just role play it out. How important to you is like nose riding? Is that an aspirational goal? Or are you like, eh, can take it or leave it? I think it looks pretty cool. And I would like to know how to do it. 
I wonder if the waves on the East Coast allow for it. I have some friends that are good longboarders, and they do occasionally yeah. do it. So I think I put it up there. Yeah, I put it up there. I think, and though, or go ahead, keep on going. No, 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 keep going, keep going. Oh, I was going to say, um, I am also interested in learning how to do like a proper turn. I'm not trying to be like a high performance longboarder, but part of me is like, if I can turn a longboard well, I, I'll be able to turn. It's just going to help my, you know, riding a shortboard, right? So, yeah. Uh, and then you're going to probably ride it when it's too small to ride other equipment that you'd prefer to be on. So, like, yeah. How like steep, pitchy, punchy is it when it's small versus kind of like rolling gutless soft? I will say we get a lot of different moods. Oftentimes the yeah. takeoff is a little soft, but then it'll hit the sandbar and then it'll get a little steep and pitchy kind of on the in the middle. And then I'll like hit a soft section, you know, like a lot of beach breaks. It kind of like varies, but it definitely gets, you know, depending on the tide, it definitely gets kind of steeper in, in Rockaway okay i already know what board i would put you on all right how big are you how tall are you uh i'm 5'7 145 pounds i would say a 9'2 or 9'4 surf thump which is our kind of like beach break slightly more versatile like the nose is pulled in just a touch from like the lumberjack or some of our slightly fuller noses so it fits a little like it fits the pocket a little better like if you put a big wide nose in a wave that has kind of a steeper section like the the risk is it's going to just wash out um and then it has so it'll fit that pocket a little better it'll hold a little better so you could like nose ride it in the pocket really well it's not as like forgiving if you get way out on that shoulder but that's not where you want to be anyway and then it's got kind of a thumb shaped tail where it's not a square tail it's not a pin tail um, but when you put like a reiki like we have our pin fin like you put a reiki fin on that thumb shaped tail and when you get back there's like a a nice little turning platform for you to just pivot off of. So you have like pretty good control. Like you can do a pretty tight cutback um, and then rail to rail when you're in the pocket, you have a lot of like little like side slipping kind of micro adjustments you can make. And so it's a pretty lively feeling board, but it will like definitely set rail and lock in the pocket for a nose ride and very versatile for like multiple wave types. It's probably my favorite longboard model of ours. I've like surfed all up and down our models over the years. And like, I, I just always come back to the surf thump. Nice. Nine, two or nine, four surf thump would be my recommendation. And how do you even think about sizing the length of the board? You know, cause to me, I'm like, either way it's big, <laughs> you know, but like, I'm sure like a nine, four versus a nine, eight versus a nine, two or whatever it is, it probably has a big difference. Like, or how, how do you guys think about that? Typically, since you're like five seven one forty five, like obviously, like once you're in the longboard realm, you can go like as big as you want. Like you could make an argument for like if you're gonna go long, just go all the way, make it a nine eight or a ten zero or something. Which there's no fault in that. But if you're wanting to like get on rail and turn that board and have a lot of control over it, uh, a nine two or nine four is still gonna give you all of the like glide of a longboard and maybe give you a little bit more control off the tail of that thing mm -hmm. but at this point with so little com to compare it to you're going to get used to whatever it is right like if you jumped on a nine six you're like all right i'm just going to get used to this and if you've been riding a nine six for two years and then all of a sudden you jump on a nine eight or a ten oh you're like oh i can definitely feel the difference but right now your frame of reference is like so different that you yeah, probably yeah. can't go wrong if a customer's in the store and they're like, oh, I just can't decide if I should do the 9.2 or the 9.4, I always am like, one in doubt, go to the higher size. Just go 9.4. Like, just, you're already in this realm, just a little extra power, paddling power, a little extra glide. Just one in doubt, go up a size. Yeah, makes sense. And then what if, you know, I'm coming at this from, you know, riding a shortboard, but what if you're like a complete beginner? Like, how does that change things? Same conditions, same, you know, situation in terms of like what my goals are and, you know, the board, how do you adjust things? Do you just go bigger size or do you not need to, you, you know, how do you think about it? I actually like pintails a lot for beginners um, because you can set a rail and you have all that curve of the outline working in your favor to where you can do these like arcing turns that kind of maintain the board's speed. And it's just a little bit easier to like maneuver. Um, so like if someone comes in and talks to us, depending on how big of a surfer they are, what kind of big, how 
bigger waves they're going to ride. I typically recommend our like eight foot joy. I'm like, it's kind of like very middle of the pack for us. It's like, if you look at our full spectrum of boards, it's like that thing is dead center and super versatile. We'll still catch waves super well. And you'll get a little bit of pushback pack from people sometimes who are like, but you know, I think I need a long board. I think I need more board than that to catch waves, which is true. But what they gain, sorry, in gaining that extra paddling and glide and wave catching, they also have now more cumbersome board to try to control. And I just think an 8.0 is honestly like where 95% of new surfers should start. And yeah, I, I just think like that that's where I would put them. If they were like dead set on, I'm brand new, but I want a long board. We have a model called the Earl. That's basically just like you stretch the joy out to a long board, rework it, make it a little fuller in the nose. Um, and I would probably put them there. But I think pintails work really well for new surfers. Just that rail-to-rail -rail ability as they're getting comfortable, I think, helps them out. Yeah. And what kind of fin setup is on that? A rake gear. Like we have a joy like a fin, fin that comes in a couple sizes. Single fin, yeah. Got it, uh, got it. The rail line on those boards is so long and they're so glidey that really all you're wanting to do is like put it up on rail and redirect it. So you don't need the bite of any extra like two plus ones or anything to do that. The pintail kind of almost acts like the, you know, it helps track the board really clean through the water. It almost acts like a fin in and of itself. So you don't need a ton of fin on those pintails to like yeah. feel like you have a lot of smooth fluid control. Got it. And, <clears throat> and so obviously, you know, being a longboarder, you're probably a big proponent of like single fins. Um, yeah. but you, you ride fishes, you ride, you know, twins, you ride, you know, smaller boards as well. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you've write, written quads and thrusters and all that. What, um, you know, so let's say that beginner ultimately, you know, maybe they, they do want to log, but then they also probably want to like eventually ride smaller craft when it gets, you know, bigger and, you know, in, in a different situation. Do you think, um, the single fin, like what are, what are the pros of the single fin? I've never ridden. I mean, I've only ridden the single fin when I'm riding that log. I don't know how to ride a single fin. I look like an asshole again, but <laughs> you know, yeah. what are the, why should someone ride a single fin? What are the big benefits to it? You know, I like how clean and fluid they track through the water. And when you go to like do a bottom turn, if you can find that right combination of like side loading the fin and loading that rail, you can really like project into a like speed generating bottom turn. Um, obviously the thing that you lose in a single fin is like, you're losing those like really tight turns where you're not going to like break the fins free and like um, do a lot of like super tight pocket turns where I'd say that's where I've really enjoyed other fin setups. But if you're looking for like fluid gliding down the line surfing that you're doing on like a bigger mid length or a long board, um, I just don't know that you need much else. Like you yeah. want it to feel stable. You want it to feel like you're just soaring down the face of the wave and you get that with a single fin. There's definitely like a, a simplicity and purity about it for sure. Um, and I remember one of my buddies was telling me, um, he was telling me that uh, Kelly Slater was watching like Clay Marzo surfing and obviously Clay Marzo was like nuts, right? He, he I've rips like story. a psycho, but he was like, yeah. Kelly Slater was like, you know, Clay, what you got to do uh, is you got to like just get on a single fin and just work on your bottom turn and just do a single fin bottom turn and just practice that over and over and over again because you need to draw out your turns. Um, yeah. I thought that was so interesting. And it's kind of like what you're talking about, right? I have heard that same story. And it's cool when you see guys who surf at that level. Like I remember uh, a couple of years ago, it's probably been four or five years now, they had like a twin fin expression session at like J Bay or something. And they had like Jordy and all these people like hop on twin fins and like surf J Bay. And I was like, this is it. This is like so <laughs> fun to watch. I was like losing my mind because it was yeah. like uh, just rad to see surfers who are that proficient on shortboard equipment riding something that's a little bit more lateral, a little bit more fluid. You can't just like a inflict your will and flick the board you know clay marzo just flicks the board around and he's you know laying back and pulling these things out that are just like so, so unrelatable to me and my personal surfing experience um yeah. so to like watch them have to like surf the wave and be very limited by 
what the wave is doing is like it's cool it's a good like change of pace not that they shouldn't keep doing the stuff they're doing but uh yeah it, it's a nice uh yeah a, a nice little change totally yeah i think i saw a similar one when they were on single fins as well and um I was actually impressed. I was like, whoa, you can do that on a single fin? I mean, they were like weird boards, right? They were like short boards, like, you know, like your potato chip 90s board, except it would be a single fin on that thing. I was like, that is oh, the trippiest hilarious. looking board I've ever seen. But they were actually yeah. still kind of ripping on it. I was like, I was like, whoa, I didn't even know you could do that, but it's sick, you know? <clears throat> That's great. So I know you guys shape a lot of longboards. Um, so moving into, you know, down a step, you know, you're talking about eight O's and what about the mid length range? Like what are kind of your thoughts around that size board? Is it something you guys have been doing for a while? Um, you know, what's, what's your philosophy with those? Uh, this is coming at a good time because I just finished writing Almond Surfboards Guide to Mid Lengths for our, like a little PDF ebook thing that I do. Um, so mid lengths are top of mind. Um, I would say the board that universally we are like most stoked on right now from like me to Griffin to like some of the shop guys to some of the team guys, like is a board called our pleasant pheasant. It's a, so we, st the joy was our first mid length. We did, we started doing those in like 2011 and it was the kind of round nose, full long rail line, pintail, kind of what I was describing a minute ago. The pleasant pheasant was kind of an answer to that where like, if you don't want those big arcing drawn out turns, but you still want the like down the line speed of a mid length and the paddling of a mid length, how do we do that? So we kind of took that outline and like shortened it and made it a little like rounder and stubbier. And so it's a little bit more of a round tail. And then we added those little tiny single tab FCS side bites. So it still has a single fin box, but then it's got these little extra side bites. So when you're going to like bite into the face of a wave and like, generate speed or like take a high line like those little side bites just help you have a little bit more resistance to press against to like really generate speed um so those boards kind of ranging from like six two to six ten um really probably most popular like six four to six six are kind of a fun combination of paddles great early wave catching you are pretty confident you're gonna like make it to the shoulder like you're going to make it down the line, but then all those turns and stuff now just became a lot tighter. So more control, a lot of speed. Yeah. It's just like this it, right now. I'd say that's like the spot that we're all kind of like most stoked and having the most fun, both from a surfing and board building standpoint. Yeah. That's epic. And you know, you, you mentioned something that I think is important to, to touch on, you know, cause I think, a lot of people jump, you know, when they make that mistake and they jump down to too short of a board, usually they catch the wave, but then they get stuck behind the wave just because their positioning is off, their wave reading is off, they don't know how to generate speed. And so they're like, I'm catching a bunch of waves, but you're not making the wave, right? And then you, you mentioned, yeah. though, the mid-length gets you on the shoulder, you know, around that, and then that, that's really the key, right? That's, And that's what I think the mid-length just, like, opens up, and you, you do that consistently, and it just gives you this totally different perspective uh, on surfing and that's awesome that you, you kind of mentioned that because i think a lot of people struggle with that right yeah uh, and i one of the things i really like about bigger boards is the ability to take off stall be in the pocket like deep in the pocket where you're you're like dragging your hand in the face of the wave but then knowing that you have enough board to where if you just like slide yourself forward a little bit and give it a little bit of oomph like you're straight down the line like having more board just gives me, at least me coming from the background of like longboarding, like confidence of like, oh, I can, I know this, is, there's enough foam here. And if I just set this rail, like we can go. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I like that. I like that. And I think what's also interesting is you mentioned that, that sweet size of like six, two to six, six. Tell me more about like how your view on that. I have a view on it as well, but what, what's your view on it? How did you pick that as your sweet spot? Because I think when people normally talk, well, you know, when I was talking to Ryan, he's like a mid-length is an 8-0, you know? And then you're saying 6-2 to 6-6. Six, six. And some people would be like, that's a short board. I think Ryan would say that's a short board too, you know? But what, what's your totally. philosophy on it? Yeah, I basically tried to define mid as like, if it's not a fish or a small board that you're like, like I don't know, like if it's like your it's hard to do heights. It's, uh, 
I don't even know where to begin with like a rule, but I think it has more to do with the like outline and the overall amount of volume at that point than it does like necessarily just the length. But I'm like six feet tall, but if I write a six four pleasant pheasant, I'm like, no, this is a mid length. Like it's got full rails, a pretty full outline. I just it you surf it the mentality is so different and how you approach surfing and how you approach the wave than I would consider like a shortboard, small board fish. I don't know. I it's like a it's kind of like I know it when I see it a little bit. No, I totally agree. I, and I think it has a, a huge difference in terms of uh, just from my experience riding different boards like that. It just like that behind me is a Christensen. It's a six six. Um, it's a Nautilus, and like okay. you can see that it's pretty wide. It's like super wide. Yeah. It's like at least twenty. It was at least twenty wide. But then it's built to be ridden at a six six. It's not like a six six short board that's been blown up. Like some people have like a six six ghost. It's like you know, it'll just be a totally different board because the, the width just gives it a different level of speed. Um, the rails are going to be pinched enough that it's it's going to still work, you know, for, for your weight. And it's not built for something that's like 250 pounds or whatever. Um, yeah. And I think at that that's like a sweet spot that just kind of really works because you can still get that speed and make the wave, but then also um, you can still kind of turn them. I mean, not the same as turning a short board, but you can, you can definitely turn them. And, and I like these guys when it's like barreling here, you know, just get in early. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and we get really bad current, like it'll just rip you down, you know, and like that just allows you to stay in position, you know, so it makes such a difference. Yeah. And I think part of the reason I would count like a six, six or a six, four or whatever as a mid length is I'm still coming off of like a childhood or like early formative years where like everyone's quiver was either like five, 10 and under like a little round fish or nine, oh, and above. And like that kind of six foot to eight eleven zone it was like oh that's a fun board you know like it just didn't exist unless it was a fun board or a beginner's board and so anything in that realm is still kind of like new territory and it was it was kind of interesting as i was like researching our little guide to mid lengths i was like doing some research on mid lengths and it was basically like bob mctavish went to yma or somewhere everyone's riding big heavy logs he got pounded hated it came back i think he went came to california on a trip and like shaped the first like 710 ring con tracker and it's like that was like 1972 and then by like 1970 or i might be getting my dates wrong it was like i want to say it was like 69 or 72 and then by like 74 the world championships were all being surfed on like six foot twin fin fishes and you're like the surfboard progression went like longboard 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 mid length shortboard like it was like just yeah. this blip in the timeline and so it was like kind of inevitable that like surf progression needed to come back and kind of revisit that like massive length gap that for the most part kind of just got like at least in the broader sense of course there's pockets here and there there's displacement holes you, can, you know people will be quick to point out that i'm oversimplifying but i know i'm oversimplifying but there's like that whole gap that you kind of like missed and needed to be revisited and re-explored. And that's where I think a lot of the most interesting stuff right now is going on. And we're included in that. Totally. Yeah, I totally see that. Now going like all the way down to like the smallest. I mean, I you guys shaped like this fun looking 5-4 foamy that fits in like a gear tunnel for a, the Rivian truck. Like tell us about that thing. So <laughs> that was our 5-4 R-series. Our R-series is like... A, mold injected fiberglass free basically soft top it's our take on a soft top right it's like real rails real bottom contours real fin boxes but it's there's no glass and we first came out with those in 2018 um people know us for those pretty universally now because there's a fair amount of them out there we were building them during 2020 and 2021 so uh there's a decent number of them in the market so I, yeah you go to the beach you see like our black one of our black foamies. Uh, the smallest one is 5.4. Uh, we recently did a collaboration with the electric car company, Rivian. Um, we actually met those, like some of the Rivian folks way back before they ever unveiled their car. Like they, I think they unveiled their car at like the 2018 LA Auto Show. And like before that even, they were like designers from Rivian were like coming into our shop 
All we knew was they were like working in some mysterious lab in Irvine on a like electric adventure vehicle. And that's all they could really tell us. And we're like, electric adventure vehicle, like that sounds rad, you know, we're in. <laughs> and so now that they're finally like big and they're publicly traded and everything, uh, we did a surfboard collaboration with them. And um, one of the dudes who works there has a Rivian truck and has the 5.4 secret menu. And he's like, yeah, I just keep mine in my gear tunnel, which is like the little like sideways tube that goes between the body of the truck and the bed. And I'm like, no way. Like there's a surfboard doesn't fit in that thing. I've seen it. It's like this little thing with a hatch. And like, I swear I keep it in there all the time. And if like, because those foamies don't need wax, like if there's just a moment where I can go sneak out for a surf, I just open the little gear tunnel, pull my board out and I go surf. And I was like, I literally was like, we're going out to the parking lot right now. Cause I, I know I just met you, but I don't believe you. <laughs> so we go out to the parking lot and sure enough, he beep, beep, like opens a little hatch and pulls his little five, four R series out and things like from 2018. It's like, well used and i was like dang this guy's not kidding like this thing fits in here so we've been joking ever since that night that was like a couple months ago like oh we need to film a thing showing that like the board fit you know fits in this gear tunnel because it's like i didn't even believe it and it's like kind of unexpected so we filmed a dumb little like 10 second instagram reel of like oh, pulling the surfboard out and putting it back in it was just like you know just something you do with your phone in like five seconds and it got like 2 million views on Instagram and like a zillion comments. Many of them were neutral. Many of them were negative. <laughs> and I'm like, man, we put so much like energy and thought and care into so many pieces of content, things we've right. produced. And I'm like, I love that it's like uh, people have a lot of opinions about cars. It's really funny. So uh, the response to that video was very outsized compared to how much thought we put into it. But we are now the surfboard brand who puts – uh, five four quads in ribbing gear tunnels apparently that's what you guys are known for that's epic all those things do look fun yeah. um last question for you um andy neobliss fries for you and he just always looks like he's having the most fun like i i guess yeah. that works perfectly with your motto as well but like what's it like working with him and doing boards for him he is like every bit as pleasant and positive and delightful as you would hope like when you watch him surf, if you're familiar at all with Andy surfing, he it seems like he's always having the most fun in the water. He's very creative. He's like primarily known as a longboarder. He's but he's always like, you know, taking off fins first, stalling, fading way behind the section, catching back up to it, running the nose. Like it's he's not like one of the longboarders who's trying to like make everything look like he's not trying. He's just like, I'm here and I'm having fun. Like He'll turn around and crouch down and like grab rail backwards, facing back towards the section and like pretend like he's like warming his hands by an imaginary <laughs> fire. And then he'll spin back around and like run up and hang five again. You're like, he's just all over the place. And he, yeah, he just like, people love his surfing because he's just like, he's not trying to look cool. He's just goofing off, having fun. And he's incredibly good at it. So he's like, He's been so fun to work with because he's just the most positive guy. And I love surfing with him. I love talking to him. I love watching him surf. Like, it, it, he's the best. We've been, we started making boards for him when he was 14. So, like, in 2011, I want to say. Oh, so, wow. it's been a long time. Um, we've had a great relationship with him for a super long time. And now we have a couple models with him. But he has, like, a signature longboard model with us called the Walks on Water. Um a signature mid length that was like based on an old garage board that he used to ride every time it got big, uh, called the arrowhead. And yeah, we're stuck. Yeah, Andy's the best. He's, he's so much fun. Oh, that's epic. <clears throat> yeah. I think his style is so interesting. Cause you know, when I think of normal traditional longboarding, it, it definitely is along a little bit more of this minimalist line, but he totally. is a minimalist maximalist, if that makes any sense. Like totally. he has really totally. good style, but then he's also a maximalist in some ways. And it's, it's epic. And it's, yeah, like it just puts a grin on your face when you're watching him. So, and I like that it's like very improvised and it's like, it's like longboarding in its worst can become very predictable and formulaic where you're like bottom turn, cross step, nose ride swing it around, cross step, nose ride, swing it around, cross step, nose ride, kick out. You're like, I, I can't watch that again. Like it's <laughs> the same thing. So the fact that he's like always just kind of innovating and the other video, I'd say the second most viral video that we've ever posted after the Rivian track is there's a clip that Jack Coleman shot of Andy 
and he's paddling out and there's a wave coming in and he kind of paddles like parallel, I guess like perpendicular to the wave. Like he's like paddling down the line and then the whitewash hits him. He grabs the rails of the board, does a barrel roll and somehow like in his doing of the barrel roll ends up back out in front of the wave and pops up to his feet and then like gets a nose ride and then runs back and then I think gets another nose ride and then runs back and then kicks out. And you're like, this dude didn't even paddle in the wave. He just barrel rolled down the whitewash and like suddenly he's up and riding. So it's that kind of stuff where people are just like, wait, what? Who is this dude? (laughs) Well, that's a new take on the no paddle takeoff, I guess. Just get hit by the whitewater and like (laughs) barrel roll into it. Come out of the wash, yeah. Oh man, that's epic. All right, one last question before we end. Um, What is a, well, actually I'm going to give you a different one, all right? If you had to, what is like, if you had to surf the same wave for the rest of your life, like what was that? What would that perfect wave be like? Like what, what? How big would it be? What would the conditions be like? I would say a chest high left hand point break that has like a nice rolling takeoff, and then it hits a section where it like pitches somewhere down toward the end. Nice. All right. Actually, and- I don't know if I want a rolling takeoff. I want. I change that. I want it. To, I just want like a nice peaking a nice like peaking takeoff because i love like getting into a wave stalling super hard like crouching trying to get a head dip and then you're like off to the races wave can begin and then i just want it to be like a 300 yard long left hand point break after that <laughs> that does sound nice I don't know who we have to talk to but if someone could you know cook up a surf pool for longer kelly. that'd be great kelly where yeah. are you at Dave has yeah, a wish don't for need you. Don't a barrel section. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and uh, who who would uh, who would be there? Would it be just you, just living it up by yourself? One or one or two other people, a crew? Like, what would it be like? Uh, my surfing right now is either solo or I'm inviting everybody. So I think if your surfing wave is that good, you have to invite everybody. All right. The whole almond crew, like all the friends, everybody. That sounds sick. All right, man. Well, thanks for joining. This was a pleasure. We'll have to do it again sometime. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, everyone. It's Van. Hopefully, you've been enjoying the podcast. Hopefully, you've been listening to some good stories, getting some good tips that are helping you improve as a surfer. If so, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review. It'll only take you literally a few seconds and share it with your friends. That's the best way you can support me so I can continue to create awesome new content for you. So thanks.